Um, so, yes, welcome everyone. Thank you very much for, for coming along. I would say it's nice to see you all, but I can't actually see you all, so I'll just take Joe's word for it that you're there. Um, as Joe pointed out, I've worked here at the Robert Burns Birthplace Museum for, for almost nine years now, and it's a, a role which I, I very much enjoy in many ways. It allows me to, to work and to indulge one of my great passions at, at the same time, which is, of course, our, our national bard, Robert Burns. So, um, as Joe pointed out, I'm going to talk about some of the, the built heritage here in Alloway, but that'll just take up part of, of this afternoon's talk, and thereafter I'm going to uh, look at some of the elements of the collection here at the Birthplace Museum as well. And uh, there are some 5,000 and odd things in the, in the, the collection here, so in order to, to make it possible to just filter the, out a few to talk about, I've gone for the old sort of curator's choice idea and just picked a few of my favourite items and I, and I hope that uh, I'll be able to sort of share my enthusiasm for those with you as the, as the talk progresses. But the, the opening uh, slide here shows uh, our bust of Burns, which is the first thing one would see upon entering the exhibition space here in Alloway. And it's a, it's a hugely impressive object, uh, solid marble, but it's after uh, a bronze original by John Steele, which uh, now resides in Poets Corner in Westminster Abbey, and it was unveiled in March 1885. And of course, this image of Burns finds himself among uh, great company there, the, the great and the good of of, of English and of English literature. Um, so John Steele, RSA, was actually the the son of a, an Aberdonian wood carver. And he became a most distinguished sculptor in his own right. And he it was actually he who introduced the technique of bronze casting to Scotland. And he has a number of full-size bronzes dotted around the world, notably in New York, Dunedin, and in London as well. So our, our next slide there shows a, a site which will be familiar to a, a great many of you, and even if you haven't, visited us here in Alloway, you'll, you'll no doubt be familiar with images of this rather humble wee house, as, as I like to put it, probably the most important wee house in Scotland, I, I tend to believe anyway. This is a, an exterior as seen from the, the road in Alloway as it, as, it, as it passes the cottage. It's built in 1757 by the poet's father, William Burns, or, or Burness actually, to give it its proper pronunciation. Some people will say Burness, some people will just contract it to Burns that we were familiar with, but I'm assured by people who know about these things that it was originally pronounced Burness in, in his native Aberdeenshire. And it was originally two rooms, a, a butt and ben, if you like, that sort of standard footprint for, for cotters' homes in, in Scotland in the past. There are these agricultural workers who, who, who would reside in, in small accommodation like this. And I don't know if you can see the cursor, but the, the kind of mid-place chimney there shows the extent of the house running from the, 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 the south gable here the, to, to the midpoint. That would be the original part of the house. And then the barn and buyer were added at some point, we believe, between 1780 and 1800. Um, and the Burns family lived here until 1766. So the first seven years of Burns' life were spent there before the, the family moved on to, to various, like Mount Oliphant, Loch Lee, um, Muskeel, and then Burns winding up eventually after staying in Edinburgh for a while at Ellisland and then finally in Dumfries where he, where he passed away on the 21st of July 1796. Um, and as it says there in my, my notation at the side, it was purchased by the Burns Monument Trust in 1881 and it then becomes part of the, the ongoing um, attempt to memorialise Burns here through tourism and visits over the past 100 and 40 years or so. Um, but the cottage itself has had a bit of a checkered history. The gable end, the south gable end there that you can see collapsed in February 1759 when Burns was merely a, a week or so old and the, the family had to decant um, his mother Agnes and, and, and her new infant had to decant and stay with a neighbour, the, the lady who had actually acted as midwife while Burns and some friends, some neighbouring friends, affected the necessary repairs. I can only imagine that having built the house just over a year before, Agnes had some choice words for him on his building skills. But um, the 
The family, even after they moved away, his father William retained the feud rights to the, to the house until 1780, which meant that he could then in turn sublet it, even though he was renting it himself, and thus the, the whole feuding, the feudal system works almost ad for an where you can chop up bits of land and, and feud them on to other people. But when it was purchased in, in about 1780, it was by the, the incorporation of Shoemakers of Air, a local trade guild, and they rented it out to people as well. And from about just prior to 1800, till it was bought over by the Monument Trust in 1881, it was actually run as an alehouse, a tavern uh, known as the Burns Head, and it traded very much on its reputation as, of being the birthplace of, of Scotland's national bard, and it had I had a, a number of very distinguished visitors during that time and of course it's time as a, a tourist destination but I'll talk a wee bit more about them later. Um, it's, a, it's looking not too bad just now, um, we, we've managed to raise the sufficient funds to, to affect a whole load of necessary repairs to it ourselves uh, just about 18 months or so ago and we were able to rethatch and re -lime wash and, and replace and repair a lot of the internal timbers and what have you. And it was all ready and good to go to open in February 2020. Uh, we were good to open and then the world closed down, so it was a, a bit of a delayed opening. But I'm happy to say we are seeing visitors return to the birthplace cottage now and, and it's, it's continuing to, to help us in telling the vital story of Robert Burns to visitors from Scotland and indeed abroad. And there's been other uh, bizarre incidents in, in, in the cottage's life. Um, in, in 1914 it was actually attacked by suffragettes, um, two ladies who had cycled down from Glasgow armed with uh, several pounds of gunpowder intent on doing grievous damage to, to the cottage. These ladies were, were Ethel Moorhead and Francis Parker and it was the the, the vigilance of a night watchman that prevented them to do so and, and, and you might think that they perhaps had some particular feminist beef with it with a national bard as a consequence of that but it wasn't actually the case they really wanted to draw attention to, to their causes as suffragettes but also uh, in a strange way they, they were actually great admirers of Burns and, and, and Frances Parker when she was tried she actually quoted from from Scots Wahey at, uh, uh, on the occasion of her trial. Um, she was an interesting character in her own right as well. She was actually the niece of Lord Kitchener, who it has to be said took a very dim view of his niece's uh, political activities. So just a couple of shots there from the, the barn and the buyer, just a, the, 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 a couple of internal shots. They don't really give you, of course, a, a, a great sense of what it's actually like inside, but I, um, I want to draw attention to the quotation there that we, we, we've put on the wall to help interpret the, the space of the buyer. This cultivated the latent seeds of posy. Uh, and that's Burns and his, his famous biographical missive to, to Dr. John Moore in 1787. And what Burns was, was saying there was that these were particularly formative years for him, as they are for everyone, these first seven years of his life. But he feels that that then, that that period really set in motion those wheels that were to lead to him being a poet due to a great many externalities, influences on his life. And again, we'll, we'll talk about them uh, uh, in a wee bit. The lower photograph there shows an internal shot of the buyer uh, with, with some stalls there. Um, and uh, we've, uh, of course, it's been interpreted numerous times over the years. We have the little cutouts of the, the small Scottish black cattle in there to give people an idea of, of what, what it would have been like to have beasts in that space. Uh, and interestingly, we believe it's the only floor in the building that still has its, it's still the original flooring, as it were. It's cobbled, one would assume, to give traction to the, the, the hooves of, of any animals in there. Um, this next slide shows the Spence, which is a wonderful wee room. I particularly enjoy being in that space, especially if I'm giving tours or talking to, to groups of school children who have come to visit. And it's a, it's a good room, a parlour, if you like, uh, in some ways, kind of cognate with our, our modern dining rooms or something like that. A room served for special occasions, but Spence actually means an inner room or a middle room in Scots. And uh, we've interpreted it by having one or two items placed in there. The furniture, although not original to the to the time of, of Burns, 
or, or to the cottage rather, is actually original to the time. They're all late 18th century pieces, some of them very Scottish in flavour. The, the object you can see leaning against the back wall is actually a, a Bible stand, a, a box used to, to, to case a Bible. And uh, there's some horn books there on the, the table, just to, to allow us to discuss the notion of Burns' early years in the cottage and how he and his younger brother Gilbert were, were taught by John Murdoch, a tutor engaged by his father and some of the other parents in the village to take on the education of their children after the, the parish school closed. And if you were to, to travel on through the Spence into the, the kitchen, we find ourselves in a, a space that I, I always find it's a, it's a somewhat emotional experience being in there because you, you take time to step back and consider that that's where arguably Scotland's most famous native son came kicking and screaming into the world on, on the 25th of January 1759 in the, in the box bed there. Um, and three siblings followed, uh, Alloway, Gilbert, Agnes and Annabella. So with those four children, another three were born after the family had, had moved on to, to subsequent farms and houses. And uh, interestingly, all of those children made it into adulthood at a time of chronically high infant mortality. I think it pays testament to Agnes's uh, skills as a mother, Agnes Brun, a lady from um, Mabel who, who married Burns' father. And then She's an interesting character, again, in, in her own right, because she was known to have a great love of Scottish song and she would sing around about the house. And we believe that this instilled in the, the young Burns his love of, of Scots song. And of course, he goes on to become a great collector and composer of song as well as a poet. And in some ways, that, that aspect of his, of his work is almost as important. He really sets the foundations, as it were, for for the great canon of, of Scots traditional song that, that we have, and he helps to preserve it. In some ways, doing work in the 1780s that, that people like Cecil Sharp in England were to do over 100 years later, and the Lomaxes were to do in, in the United States in the, in the 1930s. But it all comes back, of course, to these latent seeds that were, were planted in the, the young Burns' mind as a boy here. And there's a view of the, the other side of the kitchen there, the, the hearth, the actual, the, the, the very heart of the of the home, as it were. For as, as much as it's a kitchen, it's also, of course, a bedroom and a living room. Um, the two chairs that you can see on either side of the, the hearth there are uh, his, his, his father and mother's chairs or, or replicas thereof. The originals can be seen in the, in the museum exhibition down here in the main museum building, but it helps to really convey a sense of that, that family space and, and help us think of, of what it would have been like. Um, and you can see that the very sort of typical traditional setup for a, a cotter's hearth, the swee, the swing arm there to, that would come out with a, the girdle hanging down upon which they could bake bannocks and, 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 and stuff like that. The great black kettles there with a constant source of hot water boiling cauldrons on which they would in which they would cook things uh, the box object on the the side wall of the the chimney breast there is a as a salt bucket or a salt bucket the salt would be kept in the, the chimney space in order to keep it dry a fairly valuable commodity and we've hung on for effect on there a couple of the cruisy style lamps that they would have used to light their home. These would be lit with a, a, a rush wick going into tallow animal fat, which would have fed the, the, the tiny flame. It would only have given out a small amount of light and one would have to assume a fairly significant amount of smoke and smell. It wouldn't have been terribly pleasant, I have to say. Um, and as I pointed out, that the cottage was run as a tavern. Um, from this, about the 1780s until 1881, uh, known as the Burns Head. It had many notable visitors, as I alluded to earlier. Keats, Wordsworth, Ulysses S. Grant, President Eisenhower, Frederick Douglass, various royals over the years. Uh, uh, and very recently, we had the, the, the Duke and Duchess of, of Rossi, as they're known in Scotland, Charles and, and Camilla, visited the the cottage in, in September and myself and my, 
my line manager, Caroline, had the, the pleasure of, of showing them around. Muhammad Ali visited the cottage in 1965, a personal favourite and a, a hero of mine when I was a boy. Um, but let's go back to the, the first in the, the, the queue there, John Keats. He, he visited in 1816 by way of paying a, a literary homage, a pilgrimage to his, his great hero. Burns being a sort of morning star, as he were, as, as it were, of the romantic movement. Um, and uh, Keats met with the, the landlord of the tavern, as, uh, as it was then, a gentleman called John Miller Gowdy. And Gowdy was a bit of a soak, to tell you the truth, ladies and gentlemen. He tended, to, it seems, to spend most of his days schmoozing with the guests while his poor, long-suffering work did all the, 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 the hard, his poor, long-suffering wife did all the hard work of running the the pub. And Keats was thoroughly bored by Gowdy's company. He was a dreadful bore and told all sorts of hair-raising stories of how he knew Burns as a boy and things like that, none of which was actually true at all. It was all complete fabrication. But Keats writes a letter to his brother that night describing the visit and how sad he felt that the reputation of, of, of Burns' as a birth in early years was, was left in the hands of such a, a layabout as John Miller Gowdy. And he describes him in this letter to his brother as a mahogany-faced old jackass. So apart from the hundreds of wonderful quotations we have from Burns, we have that one from Keats directly relating to the place. Um, and one can imagine the sort of rather high and florid complexion of this mahogany-faced old jackass as he sat there and bored the poor John Keats in. Tennyson visited Jefferson Davis, Nathaniel Hawthorne, people of great literary stamp. Um, we also recently had a, a visit from Drew McIntyre, who my younger colleagues uh, reliably inform me is a, a, a world famous wrestler and some sort of wrestling champ, but he's an air lad. He's from air himself, but he's made his name as a wrestler in the United States. So it seems that this little town is still churning out the great and the good. And uh, just a couple of weeks ago, I had the pleasure of showing uh, Miss Kate Humble, her off the telly, showing her around the, 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 the site as well for a, a new TV programme she's developing about some of our wonderful coastal walks here in Ayrshire. Um, oh, and the, the reason I have this rather unusual picture um, is the, the, the door from the dispense going through into the kitchen. And of course, it's, it's graffitied because during the, the 19th century, a great many visitors would come to the site, would feel that they had to leave their mark in the, the birthplace of Burns. And of course, they, they carved their initials onto the door, certainly not something we would encourage people to do now. I have to say that would be very much frowned upon, but in, in some ways it's become a historic artifact in itself, this, this graffiti. It, it shows a, a rich kind of overlayering of, of the site, of how the, the story of Burns continues long after he, the young boy, and his family left to go to other parts. The story of Burns continues here at the cottage. So another significant building in, the, in, a, in a suite of sites here is, of course, the, the Old Kirk, which famously features in the, 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 the latter stages of Domo, if you like, of, of Burns' great narrative piece, Tam O'Shanter. We believe it was built about 1516, so really just at the end of the medieval and into the, the early modern period. Um, it was last used for worship, we understand, in 1756, but it had fallen into ruination. By the time that Burns was a boy, uh, and, and, and when he would have been familiar with it. Um, and there's a bit of a strange story about the strange story of, of Tam O'Shanter. Um, Burns was friends with Captain Francis Gross, an antiquarian, an English antiquarian, who he he met with uh, in, in Dumfries, and, and, and Burns asked if, if he might include Alloway Old Kirk in his forthcoming volume, volume two of the Antiquities of Scotland. Burns hoping to have an engraving of the Kirk placed in that, that, that tome. And Gross agreed, but he, he felt that the Kirk wasn't terribly interesting in, in its own right, nice as it was. And so he says to Burns, furnish a witch story to be printed with it. And of course, the witch story is Tam O'Shanter. And we can go back to those, again, those latent seeds of posy that I mentioned earlier on, um, as well as his, the influence of his mother in the cottage and the religious instruction of his father and the educational influences 
of John Murdoch. Burns also came under the influence of one Elizabeth Davidson, Betty Davidson, a sort of a beloved aunt to Burns. She was in fact the widow of his wife's cousin. She was an older lady and she'd come round to help take care of the children whilst Agnes was busy with dairying duties and, and, and housekeeping and things like that. And I'm paraphrasing here, but Burns in that letter to John Moore describes her as a great repository of all these wonderful folk tales and tales of witches, goblins, elf candles, spunkies, giants, haunted castles, dragons, that sort of thing. So again, wheels are set in motion for things fantastical and, and part of that we can imagine comes through in Burns' telling of the, the tale of Tam O'Shanter. It's, it's, it's actually based on three separate stories that Burns later recounts in a, in a letter to Gross that are directly um, attributable to, to, to Alloway, three folk tales about witchcraft. So, so what Burns is doing is just working with the, the kind of folk culture of, of, his, of his home patch, as it were, to create Tam O'Shanter. And it's a wonderful, truly really wonderful poem, especially if you hear it recited by far better Burnsians than me who can do it justice at a Burns supper. And thou, Tam, saw a nunca sight, warlocks and witches in a dance, Nico tail yon Brent, you fae France, but hornpipes, jigs, strats, bays, and reels put life and metal in their heels. A winnock bunker in the east, there sat old Nick in shape of beast. A toozy tyke, black, grim and large, to gie them music was his charge. He screwed the pipes and gulped them skirl till the roof and rafters a dead diddle. So there you go, folks, a wee bit of Tam O'Shanter there, and that's what Tam in the poem would have seen looking through the, kicking in through the wee windy on the side of the kirk. And if you look into this space now, you can see these wonderful mort safes that are there. These would have been used in graveyards across Scotland throughout the 18th and early 19th century to protect the bodies of the, the cadavers of the recently dead and passed as they've been buried, to protect them from resurrectionists, body snatchers, if you like, people of the elk of Mrs Burke and Hare, those two famous body snatchers of old Edinburgh. Um, but it's interesting if you if you look up and see the the Winnock bunker there, um, the, the the east window in the kirk when when Burns published or, or wrote the poem and it was published in seventeen ninety. Burns is ever the the symbolist in his, his poetry and he knew exactly what he was doing, placing old Nick Satan in the east window. You know that most sacred part, the eastern part of, of the kirk. It's it's a wee bit devilish in itself, and I think there's a wee bit of Burns in in Tam. Too. Um, I often think that. But it's a wonderfully atmospheric place to visit, even on a, a fairly bright autumn day, as it was when I took these photographs. It's distinctly grimmer and all the way here today. But even on a nice day, it's still very atmospheric when you, you go into the graveyard and, 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 and the environs of the old kirk. And there are some wonderful gravestones there, ladies and gentlemen. This one's a particular favourite of mine. It, it, it's uh, from the 17th century and it, it features some trade imagery, which is a very common thing in gravestones of that particular period in Scots history. And you can see quite clearly here that the trade in question was that of a farrier. You can actually see the man at work around the feet of his horse. You can see the tongs that he would have been using his trade and there's an image of a horseshoe there. There's also a memento mori, a skull and crossbones, a rather stylized skull and crossbones, uh, I have to say. And the hourglass there on the upper right, which um, is interesting, it's a very common theme in the, the Presbyterian imagery of these, these gravestones, and we believe it was to remind the, the, the still living that the sands of time are constantly running and that they're running out for all of us and that there will be judgment in a very Presbyterian way. Uh, some of these hourglasses are often carved on their side and I can't really get a definitive answer on this. Various writers that I've read will say two, two very different things about this next thing, whether it's true or not. But I have read that uh, an hourglass pictured on its side signifies a life cut short, one cut short by, by accident or by sudden this bout of disease or even by murder or more sinister means I can't actually say that that's 100% true but various writers I have come across have cited that. And another hugely important grave in the graveyard and it's the first thing you see upon ascending the wee set of stairs and walking into the, the graveyard is the that of William, the, the poet's father. Um, 
He was buried here February 1784. But he was living at Loch Lee at that time, some, some few miles away, but the body was processed all the way to be buried in an Alloway kirkyard. And it's a place that, that clearly William felt some deep connection to uh, if it became ultimately his final resting place. At the, the time that the family lived here, the, the, the wall around the kirkyard was in a state of ruination and, and cattle were free to pasture within its bounds. And this, of course, very much irked the, the strongly Presbyterian burns for although the kirk itself was ruined, it was still a burial ground and it was still sacred ground. So the Presbyterian zeal, one would assume that he'd have, he rounded up a few again of his, of his neighbours friends, neighbors and friends. They, by subscription, raised some funds. They got a pass from the Air Town Council and they repaired the wall going around there. So it shows that he had a connection to this kirkyard. Um, Isabella, uh, Robert's youngest sister, is also buried here in this particular plot. And although it says the name of his spouse, Agnes, on there, she's actually buried over in Bolton Kirkyard, over in East Lothian on the, on the east coast of Scotland. And this is, in fact, a replacement stone, ladies and gentlemen, because uh, bizarre and, and, and somewhat horrifying as it may seem, people used to come and they chip little pieces off the original gravestone to take away as, as mementos of their visit to, to, to this hugely important site here in Halloween. And it sends a sort of shiver down that curatorial part of my spine to think of that as a thing happening, quite apart from the fact that it would be considered very poor taste by today's standards as well. You re one really shouldn't go about chipping bits off people's gravestones. But um, this is a replacement stone. But on the rear of the stone, we can see a verse composed by, by the poet to uh, memorialise his father um, by way of an, an epitaph, if you like, and if you'll permit me. O ye whose cheek the tear of pity stains, draw near with pious reverence and attend. Here lie the loving husband's dear remains, the tender father and the generous friend. The pitying heart that felt for human woe, the dauntless heart that feared no human pride. The friend of man to vice alone a foe, for even his failings lean to virtue's side. And I, I actually love this, this piece. So, in amongst all of the, the, the canon of Burns' work, all the polemics and nationalist fervour, the patriotism, the radical politics, the love poetry, the bawdry, the, the sort of comic macabre side of, of Tam O'Shanter, we have this moment of, sort of perfect poignancy. And, and I think it's a beautiful piece. It, it, it says no more to us than simply the loving father's, the loving son's loss for, for, his, for his father. And it's every time I go into the graveyard, I make a point of rereading it. And it always brings a wee bit of a lump to my throat, actually, because it's a, such a wonderfully poignant piece. And it shows a very human side to Burns, something that's sometimes swept aside as we, as we memorialise them here with great monuments and museums, things like that. And that great monument, you can see here, ladies and gentlemen, the world famous, I have to say, Burns Monument opened in, in 1823. And it was, it was paid for by a subscription after a campaign led by Alexander Boswell, the, the son of James Boswell, the redoubtable diarist and friends of the, of the great Dr. Johnson. It was designed by one William Hamilton, who, who won the contract to design it through the competition. And it's based on the, the Temple of Lysicrates in Athens. Lysicrates was a, a notable Greek who was a great uh, patron of the arts. Um, it stands some 70 foot high. It's topped with the, the gold tripod, as you can see in the kind of style part that the, 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 the tripod is resting on. Uh, is formed of three very stylized dolphins. They're actually the symbol of the, the Kennedy family, that nearby family of great repute here in, in, in South Ayrshire. And there are nine pillars going round the monument, um, and, and each of those are, are said to represent the the, the newsies of, of, of Greek antiquity. So those great goddesses of the arts that are clearly very appropriate in a, a building of this type, dedicated to, to such a creative mind as Burns. And it has a triangular base, and, and, and each side of that triangular base is, is oriented to the, the, the three old districts of, of Ayrshire, Kyle, Carrick, and, and Cunningham. And, and, and it's a 
in many ways it's a it's a record of, of Freemasonic and, 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 and classical symbolism, as one would expect with a, the Burns story. There's a, an interesting wee, wee adjunct to the tale, though. Uh, the, the gentleman who led that subscription campaign, Alexander Boswell, son of James, he actually died before the monument was opened in 1823. He died in, in 1822 in the last ever officially recorded duel in Scotland. Would you believe he'd had a bit of a beef in the press? With a gentleman called James Stewart, Lord Dunern. Um, they were political opposites, but um, uh, Boswell had sent some rather scurrilous material in the form of letters to, to, to parts of the press, and he'd done so under a pseudonym. But Dunern's friends in the press revealed to, the, to them, to him rather, who they'd come from. Um, the row escalated, a duel was duly called, and they uh, it transpires that um, Boswell had fought several duels in the past and was quite a, a noted duelist and he, he did what one would expect. He behaved in a gentlemanly way and purposely fired high. Um, Dunern, who'd never fought a duel in his life, we think kind of panicked a wee bit, <laughs> let off a round. The musket ball went right through um, poor old Boswell's shoulder and he died in agonising pain, it seems, a couple of days later. I think there's something there, a wee bit of a lesson to us all about hubris and dueling. However, Boswell may be gone, but almost 200 years later, the monument still stands. And again, we've spent a huge amount of time and money on it, ladies and gentlemen, to, to bring it back up to up to scratch, as it were. We, we spent uh, a couple of years using our own stonemasons and various other contracted experts to restore the stonework using traditional methods and traditional lime mortar. And it is now, I'm happy to say, watertight and gleaming once again in the occasional Ayrshire sunshine that we get. Um, the interior, I'm not going to dwell too much on it, but it's certainly worth a, a visit. The bust of Burns there, one of the earliest uh, burns, uh, busts of Burns, incidentally. And it's, uh, as I say, it's been recently refurbished and you can see how lovely, clean and dry the, the sandstone of the interior is nowadays. So moving on, this other wonderful edifice that you can find here in, in Alloway, the, the Brego Dune. Um, made famous, of course, by Tam O'Shanter. You know, Tam does win the key stain of the brig, as the poem tells us. But Nanny, far before the rest, she, she grabs poor Meg's tail and after a, when I assumes a, a millisecond of terrifying struggle, the tail pings comes loose in, in Nanny's hand and Tam is carried to safety on the other side for as we all know witches cannot cross running water certainly not in Scotland at any rate and uh, Tam makes it home we assume a wiser and perhaps better man although I wouldn't entirely bet on that but the brig has been saved from demolition twice through the night throughout the nineteenth century. Um, the, it was, the stone was due to be used in, in other constructions, which again seems utterly horrific and, and, and bemusing to us now. But I suppose you have to frame these things within the context of their times. It's around about fifty foot high at the, the keystone. It's a single span late medieval bridge, um, and indeed. The movie Brigadoon did borrow the name of this structure. So if you can imagine the, the wonderful Mr. Gene Kelly dancing about in a fantastically lurid tartan outfit, the, the name originally starts off here in Alloway. And a slightly less edifying, I think, structure, but nonetheless hugely important one is the, the current museum, this modern building. I've been a, a wee bit unfair there, ladies and gentlemen. It's a some is a second home to me. I spend so much time here, but it, it has a lot of very important positives attached to it. For one, it houses the collection and state of the art surrounds. It has a, a wonderful green roof. It's heated from a, a ground source heat pump. So 10 years or so ago when it was built, we were very much thinking then of its place in the landscape and how we could minimise the environmental impact of it. And when you consider the great machinations political and environmental that have been going on in Scotland over the past few weeks. It's good to know that the NTS are still doing our bit to, to play a part in that. It was opened in 2009 and it houses the largest collection of Burns related items in the world. As I mentioned earlier, it's more than 5,000 pieces here, most of which are in storage, but a select and rather wonderful selection are on display. And I'm duty bound to tell you all that it is a great day out. And please, if you haven't visited, ladies and gentlemen, 
I urge you to consider doing so. You might even meet me. And uh, upon entering the, the exhibition space, as I told you earlier, the, one of the first things that you see is the, the bust of Burns. But the second thing that we see is this rather wonderful mahogany writing desk and the parlour chair, both of which belonged to Burns. Um, Burns said in, in, uh, later that uh, he used to swing on the hind legs of my elbow chair by way of calling forth my own critical strictures as my pen goes. Um, so he would sort of lean back on the, the hind legs of his chair. One can imagine almost the, the quill in his mouth as he, as he pondered the next line of whichever masterpiece he was composing at the time. And we did used to have the chair sat at a rather jaunty an angle by some uh, devilish cantrip. We, we managed to do that. It was actually done with, with two small concealed plastic legs holding up the four legs of the chair. But despite having signs all over it, people would insist on sitting on it and, the, and they kept breaking. So it's just flat on the ground now. Uh, so if you do visit us, folks, please don't sit on any of the items. Um, the, the armchair is, is mahogany. Um, and uh, the, the research tells me, and I'm absolutely no expert on, on, on the construction of, of vernacular Scottish chairs, but it's with a rectangular top rail, slightly concave and with splat formed of three columns and stylized and narrow vase shape, the central one also pierced. If that means anything to any of you, ladies and gentlemen, you can maybe enlighten me later, but uh, they are rather wonderful things because of all the items in the, in the collection, you can get up close to these. They aren't in a case, they're just on, on, on open display. And of course, we actually have to think of history being made on these particular items. You know, Burns did sit here. He did lean on this desk. He did compose wonderful pieces here. You know, during his time in Dumfries, Scots where he is there for honest poverty with a flowed off the end of his, of his quill as he leaned on this little writing desk. And it's always worth taking a moment to consider that sense of, of sheer history when you, you visit the, the museum here in Alloway. Um, this is a really wonderful item. Again, I think there's a, an element of real poignancy ascribed to this. It's a the second edition, if you like, of his works, uh, poems chiefly in the Scottish dialect. It's the second Edinburgh edition. Um, so it was published by, or put out by William Creech in, in 1793, and it's inscribed in, in the poet's own hands uh, to his daughter Elizabeth. It was gifted to her. Um, she was... Um, uh, Burns first born and, 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 and she was of a legitimate birth. But um, we see here or get here a real sense of the of the, the love Burns had for his children. Um, and, and, and that comes across in a great many of his, of his letters and his works. Um, a poet's welcome to his love begotten daughter is the, the more acceptable title for, for, for the, the, the poem he composed for young Elizabeth. Um, In some ways, it's it's a hugely interesting thing because it, there's a strange quirk attached to it. It's, it's the second impression of the Edinburgh edition. Now, the first edition of that was the famous stinking edition. And that's no reflection on, on my great hero's works, of course. But in the, the address to the haggis, instead of the, the phrase skinking wear that jumps and luggies, it was typeset as stinking wear. So... Burns obviously picked up in that and the subsequent edition had the correction put into it. But if you can come across a stinking edition, it's anything but stinking. It's a real sort of rarity because it, of course, signifies it's from that very first run of the Edinburgh edition. And it was expanded on after the, the Kilmarnock edition. It contains a further 17 poems and five songs that weren't included in the earlier Kilmarnock edition. Um, two of the rather wonderful items here, one of which is very famous indeed, the famous Greg uh, violin. But also we have Burns's little guitar, because it's important to th think about the, or remember the, the notion of musicality in Burns' life. Um, and a, a letter to George Thompson, he, he writes that he was a, a fiddler and a poet, which is rather juxtap strange juxtaposition of, of the language of the words. He's a fiddler and a poet, almost as if being a musician comes first in the, the mind of Burns. And of course, he, he sees himself in the bardic tradition, you know, from a time when, when poetry and music are far more inextricably bound up. And this is his little English guitar. 
Um, it's a rather wonderful wee, wee object, and it's actually the, the oldest English guitar that we have in any collection here in, in, in Scotland, as far as we're aware. But the Greg Fiddle is a beautiful thing. If you just take a second to look at it, ladies and gentlemen, the wonderful ink tin designs, it's a beautiful example of folk art in its own right. It's, it's a vernacular piece. It was made here in Scotland, probably Ayrshire, in around about 1750. And it belonged to one William Gregg, who was the dancing master in the village of Turbolton. Burns attended uh, dancing lessons as, as a, bo a teenage boy there. Um, in the, the room, which is now in the, the upper story of the Bachelors Club, where it, which later housed his debating society that he set up with, with his younger brother Gilbert in 1780. And Burns is said to have gone along very much against the wishes of his, of his Presbyterian father, William. William being a fairly typical dual Presbyterian of the, of the time. He disapproved of frivolities like dancing, one would assume. But Burns said it was to give his manners a brush because social dancing was considered a, a, a very important social skill in, in, in that part of the, the late 18th century. But reading between the lines and knowing Burns as we did, it would be an opportunity to engage with the fairer sex. He would have met lassies there and he would have enjoyed the sort of conviviality and social scene that we know he went on to enjoy throughout his life. Um, the Greg does get played fairly regularly. I'm forever getting into that case and getting it out and putting it back in again. And there are only a few very, very good violinists who we allow to, to play this wonderful piece. And they, they assure me that it's a bit of a horror to play and completely unmusical, ladies and gentlemen, but it seemingly goes out of tune very quickly and it reacts to, to any sort of fluctuation in temperature in the space in which it's being played. However, they always struggle on and, and, and do a grand show for us. Um, so I just want to show you a couple of other elements of the, of the museum. This is a, just a, an interpretive piece that we've set up because it's we can't really talk about Burns and his writing without considering his... Um, a rather thorny relationship with the Kirk, with the, with the Church of Scotland, and this is designed to to, to sort of interpret that for, for our visitors. So we have here a pulpit and a cutty stool or a creepy chair, which uh, Burns had to ascend on occasion in the in the Kirk in Mauchland. And this was a seat of admonishment where people deemed to have been sinners by the by the, the Kirk session, those rather sort of unpleasant kangaroo courts of, of the Church of Scotland and that from that period in history. People would be found guilty of various transgressions, would have to sit or stand, depending on the, the design of the creepy chair, at the front where they would get a bit of a shuriken and admonishment from no doubt one of the, 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 the ministers that Burns would later go on to attack and so many of his wonderful satires and, the, and polemics that were aimed at, at the Kirk. And, and if you sit on it now, by again by some devilish cantrip or indeed by a, a wee infrared light, if you sit on it, you'll get ranted at by some unseen Presbyterian old licht minister, which is rather good fun. And we have a display immediately adjacent to this, which looks at another great influence on Burns's life, and that's Freemasonry. Um, Burns entered into that particular brotherhood. He was entered into Freemasonry in the town of Turbo. And there's a wee bit argy bargy, as we say here in, in, in Ayrshire, about as to where it happened. But we tend to go with the story that he was entered into Freemasonry in the Bachelors Club itself, which was housing the, the lodge at that time. Um, Burns later goes on to be a worshipful master in the lodge. And there's a schism and two different lodges emerge until Bolton. And then I believe they, they later sort of rejoin and become a, a singular institution again as, as, as time goes on. But now I want to a, a, a couple of items, and, and again, I've included these because they, they happen to be absolute favourites of mine. These are the, the Tweedy carvings of, of scenes from, from Tam O'Shanter, carved by Thomas Hall Tweedy in about 1860, which makes them contemporaneous, really, with the, the pieces that, that, that they're taken from, the wonderful engravings of Tam O'Shanter by the Scottish artist John Fowd. Uh, and we have the first and second in the sequence here, boozing at the nappy. And Tam must ride. We can see Tam in the first one there with Suter Johnny, his ancient trusty Druthy crony, enjoying the convivial atmosphere of the inn and air before he sets out to take his uh, rather terrifying ride through the storm and before coming to the kirk. And the scene that I described earlier from Tam O'Shanter, we can see there 
ladies and gentlemen, the warlocks and witches indeed in their dance and the, the dead standing in the coffins like open presses holding up the candles and this was wonderful detail in these you know carved from from limewood and i often find that whenever i take groups of children around the museum they're, they're drawn to these like children like the notion of miniaturization and scenes like this and they're almost toy like they're, they're such beautiful wee things um and you can see the the winnock bunker in the east there with the toozy tyke with, with, with old nick himself Keen at Laldi, as it were, on the pipes, and the, the witches having a rare old time at their Sabbath just before Tam royally puts his foot in it and roars out, Wheel done to cut his sark. They, of course, give chase. And in, in the final piece here, we can see Tam just escaping and no more over, I have to say, a rather stylized <laughs> small version of the, the Brig of Dune with, with Maggie hard on her heels, or Maggie, sorry, galloping over, and Nanny hard on his heels there, holding on to poor Maggie's tail. Um, and this is a, a, a truly wonderful thing, ladies and gentlemen. I consider myself so lucky to be able to go and just look at these things on a on a daily basis. You know, this is a volume one of the Scots Musical Museum Burns own copy. Um, the Scots Musical Museum was a project started in around about 1787 by one James Johnson, a printer of sheet music in Edinburgh. And Johnson had had done rather well at printing sheet music through pewter engraving and, and, and this was a method that he pioneered in Scotland and it allowed him to indulge in side projects, one of which was this and it was ultimately to become a six volume collection of traditional and gathered and collected Scots song and there were a number of people sub who subscribed to this and, and, and it took part. Um, but Burns was, after meeting Johnson, you know, hugely enthused. And, and whilst Johnson's re really as the, the editor, Burns becomes, in effect, a literary editor. Uh, and of the, the 600 pieces in the entire set of volumes, about 200 are ascribed to Burns uh, pieces that he, he, he writes or pieces that he adapts, pieces that he, that he, he alters. Uh, and, and of course, one of the most famous of these ultimately is Old Lang Syne, although the Old Lang Syne that you can see printed here, ladies and gentlemen, on, on the left is actually the version by Ramsey, Alan Ramsey, that great writer in Scots and, and I suppose a sort of predecessor of Burns along with his elder brother in the muse, Robert Ferguson, these two great and very formative influences on Burns's Scots writing. And Burns has rather wonderfully written his version there excuse me, his version there on, on the interleaved section. And on to the uh, final thing I want to show you here, folks, because it, it, in some ways it's, it's the very heart and soul of the Burns culture. And this poem's chiefly in the Scottish dialect, published in Kilmarnock in 1786. So here we have it, a Kilmarnock edition. It's uh, one of two that we have here in the museum. This one's on display. As you can see, it's open there at poor Mealy's Elegy, that wonderful piece about a lost sheep. And uh, there were 612 copies printed. And within about three weeks, 599 of those had been sold or, 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 or had been accounted for through a process of subscription as well. So it shows you that from the very outset of his printed work, Burns was a success. And that success fluctuated in those final 10 years of his life. But of course, when he did pass away, he becomes even more famous. Within five years, we hold the first burn supper here in the cottage at Alloway. And we continue, ladies and gentlemen, to remember Burns here. But what I would say is this, I always tell people, it's great to visit the museum and I certainly wouldn't discourage anyone from doing so. But you can have your own wee museum in the house, a wee bit like the Scots Musical Museum. You can have your own paper museum, get a complete set of Burns works, a copy of his letters and one or two of the better biographies and you have your own wee museum. But I have to give you fair warning, warning, ladies and gentlemen, it can be habit forming. Absolutely. I first picked up a book of Burns about 23 years ago and I've not really put it down since. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. I hope you've enjoyed my talk.